coming up on this edition of Ableton on Air. Brain injury, what is it? And what is neuroscience? We talk with um, the Brain Injury Alliance of Vermont. All that and much more when Ableton on Air starts right now. Major sponsors for Ableton On Air include Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps, Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yihad of New York and New England, where everyone belongs, the Orthodox Union, the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, Montefiore Medical Center of the Bronx, Rose F. Kennedy Center of Bronx, New York, Albert Einstein College of Medicine of the Bronx. Ableton on Air has been seen in the following publications. Parchester Times, www.thisisthebronx.com, New York Pirate Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.h.com, and the Montpelier Bridge. Ableton On Air is part of the following organizations. The National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, Boston, New England chapter, and the Society of Professional Journalists. Welcome to this edition of Ableton On Air, the one and only program that focuses on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently abled. I've always been your host, Lauren Seiler. We focus on abilities, not disabilities. With me today to discuss the Brain Injury Alliance of Vermont is Ashley McCormick, Neuros Neural Resource Facilitator of the Brain Injury Alliance of Vermont. Welcome to Thank Ableton you. On Air. What is the missions and goals of the Brain Injury Alliance of Vermont? So our vision and our mission is to make Vermont a place where brain injury survivors can live and... Take your time. Sorry. I'm trying to memorize my, our, our statement on the... Okay. Our vision and mission is to make Vermont a place where brain injuries are not only supported and prevented, but also um, people who already have them to have them have services and supports to meet their needs and their goals. Okay. What are, are the services that you, obviously today we're here talking about neuroscience, mm -hmm. but what are the services that you guys provide? Yeah, so we have um, a few services and things that we provide. We originally started as uh, just a helpline. So we have um, you know, a helpline that's Monday through Friday and people can call and get information about brain injury, services, supports, um, re referrals. And we also have webinars, support groups, um, a financial assistance program and our neuro resource facilitation program, which is um, similar to options counseling and helps individuals with brain injuries and their families and supporters find resources and supports to meet their goals and, and their needs. So is neuroscience a new field, yes or no? I would say newer 
um, because it's in the, the grand field of medicine, it, it is a little bit more new than some other fields. Um, but I would say that it's, it's definitely more emerging now that we are having um, more ways to br do brain Im imaging, uh, more ways to look at neurotransmitters and more ways to um, really look at the brain in, as a whole in a holistic view. Um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely emerging. So uh, myself being a survivor of, of brain injury, um, what is the difference between um, things like traumatic brain injury, epilepsy, cerebral palsy, so on and so forth? Mm -hmm. Can you kind of break down um, didn't mean to be so technical, mm -hmm. but can you break down the situation? Yeah, so we, our organization and a lot of um, other places in the United States um, have started to kind of shift from just looking at brain injuries as traumatic. So in history and textbooks, we're seeing TBI, 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 traumatic brain injury. Now we are looking at things from a TBI and a non-TBI lens. So we have TBIs, which are direct blows to the head. So that's your typical brain injury of, um, you know, you get hit in the head with an object. That could be a TBI. Whereas a non-traumatic brain injury is a brain injury caused by other, other forces, other um, bodily functions, other, other things. So we would put seizures, epilepsy, um, MS, Alzheimer's, dementia, we would put those things as non-traumatic because they were not a direct blow to the head, but they are something that has caused a brain injury. So um, I'm just going to, because we'll, we'll put this in editing. Mm -hmm. uh, um, it says moderate to severe traumatic brain injury, an injury that affects how the brain works. It may cause, may be caused by a bump, a jolt, in the head, penetrating injury such as the gunshot, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, um, are you are you a are you a doctor? No. You're not a doctor. But can you explain, like, uh, so brain is brain injury caused? So it's like electrical impulses, and, and if a brain injury is caused, what actually happens? Mm -hmm. So a brain injury. Um, is often, if it's caused, you know, no matter what the cause is, traumatic brain injury, so a blow to the head, or um, you were born with something. A brain, like cerebral palsy. Mm -hmm, right yeah, right. a brain injury can affect different lobes and areas of the brain. So the brain is comprised of different lobes, and each one does a different thing. So no matter, depending on where your brain injury is affecting, what lobe it's affecting, it can affect different things that come out externally. So for example, if someone, um, their frontal lobe, which is, um, responsible for um, making decisions and um, thinking and uh, reasoning, if that's affected, someone can be really impulsive, they can make um, bad decisions, and it really can be from a direct damage to their frontal lobe. Okay, so now that we said all of that, um, so you offer counseling in neuroscience. We don't offer um, counseling, like we don't offer um, specific counseling, but we do offer um, referrals and assistance and um, options. So options counseling is um, kind of like that. Our program is kind of in between options counseling and case management. So we work directly with the survivor and or their family members or sometimes their medical providers um, to you know, see what they really need, what their goals are, and what organizations in Vermont can we connect them with to help them meet those goals. Okay, um, so what type of assistance mm -hmm. do you offer? You, you mentioned uh, off camera some other assistance, go ahead. Yeah, so we um, mostly do, so we do a lot of advocacy work, so um, education, advocacy, consults with other medical providers to um, kind of advocate for the survivor and say, you know, this is something that is directly affecting their brain. So whatever behaviors they have, it's not their fault, they're, they're, they had a brain injury. And so we do a lot of advocacy work because there's a lot of misconceptions about brain injuries and a lot of um, you know, negative stigma around a brain injury. What is some of the negative stigma, uh, since, uh, since we said that? Mm -hmm. um, um, why do people stigmatize um, people with brain injuries? 
Yeah, I, I don't know where it comes from, but I do I do see in the in the field um, of mental health of medical um, services that oftentimes people with brain injuries are labeled as difficult, um, and they're labeled as labeled as. Difficult? Yeah, difficult or um, lazy. They don't. They don't do. Um, they don't accomplish tasks that are given to them. Um, they can be labeled as. Um, I mean, a lot of people with brain injuries have anger issues um, or outbursts. So Some, I'm going to say this, but sometimes, if someone was to put themselves mm -hmm. into someone else's shoes, mm -hmm. then they would see how to help them. Mm -hmm. If, since they don't know, see, that's the thing. Uh, people don't know enough about people with disabilities. Or go ahead. I yeah. Mean, uh, if yeah. You want to say something. No, with totally, that. totally agree with you. Um, and oftentimes, we live in such a structured system. So, um, you know, social security, the medical system, the mental health system, the housing system. We live in um, a world where there's so much structure and there's so much you have to do this to get this you have to complete this pay packet to get this and someone with a brain injury sometimes oftentimes they have uh, they struggle with executive functioning they struggle with follow-through they struggle with paperwork and um, organization so a lot of these agencies are just not structured in a way to actually help a survivor complete these tasks now Senator said that mm -hmm. Social Security, government, there's a lot of, and other governmental organizations are bureaucratic. Mm -hmm. Nine times out of ten, a lot of people with, um, with brain injury receive Social Security. Mm -hmm. Is, my next question is, is brain injury listed as a uh, cerebral palsy, but is certain brain injuries listed on for people to get Social Security or because some disabilities are silent? Mm. Go ahead. Is there a way around yeah, that? Yeah. Um, if you're helping somebody with services. I, I hope that was a, a bad question. No, 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 it's not. Um, no, I, I would say uh, oftentimes it comes up to their documentation. So um, often it's, you know, the medical providers they've worked, it, worked with, whatever diagnoses that their medical providers have given them, whatever um, documentation they have from the past, um, that really shapes the Social Security application, is my knowledge, um, because I do know people who have gotten denied. And um, oftentimes, you get denied being brain injured? Yeah, oftentimes they get denied um, because maybe their documentation wasn't all there, or um, a lot of the times actually people are, are told, survivors are directly told, um, there's a good chance you're going to get denied on your first try, so you have to try again. Um, and that, I don't even think that's only for brain injury. I think that's for like a lot of disabilities actually, is that on the first try, sometimes they do get denied, which is you know a very unfortunate reality. Um, what are some of the misconceptions, let's go back to this, mm -hmm. what are some of the misconceptions around brain injury yeah. people, when people first meet people? Yeah, so I would say um, a brain injury is a little bit more complex than a lot of other injuries and disabilities. So a common, a common saying in the field is when you've seen one brain injury, you've seen one brain injury. What that means is that not ev you see you know a line of people, a support group, um, in an agency where there's a lot of survivors. Each one of those survivors is going to be very different in the way their injury happened, what got affected in their brain, um, and what. People, I'm going to say this: mm -hmm. people are not cars. One car doesn't have everything. Mm -hmm. It's not one size fit all. Mm -hmm. no, but in terms of people. Not everybody needs every single service, but when you need it, it's there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and not every brain injury is the same. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So I would say the biggest misconception is people, and a lot of times this is providers, med like medical, mental health, um, case managers, a lot of times people will group them together. They'll say, you know, oh, you know, in their mind, they'll, they'll, they'll think, you know, oh, this per I've worked with a brain injury survivor before and they had really difficult behaviors. So they're going to stigmatize other survivors because they think that all these other survivors are also going to be super difficult. 
Um, so that's probably the biggest. Why do they label people that are super difficult? Is there a reason for that? I don't know. Um, my view is, and what we've talked about in our organization often, is that the people who are labeled as difficult are typically the ones that are pushing back against that system. So the people that are questioning the system and, and saying, this doesn't make any sense. Why are we doing it this way? Um, because they're pushing on that system that is so structured and has been in our country and in, in the state for so long, um, they're labeled as difficult and are often written off um, or taken off services or tried to push them onto other services to get them away, off their backs. Um, that's, that's our view uh, that we see often. Do you think Vermont can do, uh, do you think Vermont provides adequate services for people who, uh, who are brain injured or do you think we can provide more? We can provide more, yeah. We, How so? Yeah, um, I would say our agency... I'm getting to a point. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I think we, we need to be providing more. Um, we went to a conference, uh, myself and my coworkers went to a conference where we talked with a bunch of brain injury alliances and associations in the whole country. So people from Colorado, Alaska, we went to this conference and we're talking about all of these services that th these people have, these states have. Colorado is a very robust brain injury state, so they have so many services. They just opened a like 92 apartment building just for brain injury survivors, where the low lights are dim, the, the noise isn't super loud, um, the wall colors, the fixtures, everything is structured for a brain injury survivor to feel comfortable and safe. And we have nothing like that in Vermont. I mean, we have. We have apartment buildings. I mean, we have HUD housing, and we have, you know, certain buildings for elderly and for elderly and disabled, mm -hmm. but not, um, you know. So, since you said that, what needs to change? Number one, and um, when it comes to services like housing. Uh, Dealing with brain injury, what would you like to see? Mm -hmm. uh, so, what needs to change? That that's a huge question. I'm trying to think of how it all comes down to money, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, there is just not enough money trickling down to services that we can give brain injury brain, brain injury survivors actual concrete services. Really, um, we have um, a few waiver programs in the state: Choices for Care, the Brain Injury Program, that I can definitely ex talk about, but um, even those programs have wait lists, and um, there's no telling if someone will. However, if it's an emergency. Mm, mm -hmm. you, However, if, if it's an emergency. If it's an emergency, yeah. you can push for stuff. Yes, exactly, exactly. And if why does it have to come down? Yes. To being an emergency. Yes. I don't mean to put it out there, but. Yeah. 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 No, you're, and you're right, and um, that's our system of care. Is that is that so? Which, if you are not in deep poverty or you are not experiencing a medical emergency and you're in that middle ground of struggling so hard but you're not at that level, you're likely not gonna get any help or you're not gonna get the help you need. So that's where we as an organization are trying to fill that gap of how can we help the people in the middle so that they don't fall down and they don't fall through the cracks. Um, so that's a huge thing. We need more services for those people who we just we want to stabilize, we want to help stabilize, we want to help them help themselves. Um, we just don't have enough of that in our state. I would love to see um, specific targeted case management for brain injury survivors. Oh, explain what that is. So that would be um, targeted case management for brain injury survivors and they don't have to be on a waiver program. So to be on a waiver program, you need to be, you need to be very poor. Um, you need to qualify for certain Medicaid and other things. And I would love to, see, we as an organization, would love to see brain injury case management for people and we don't look at finances. So you can have any amount of resources, any amount of money, you can be on any, you know, anywhere in, in the system of care and you can access case management because that's a huge need for survivors. Mm -hmm. uh, how has media, how has the media, past, present, and future, how has the media dealt with um, brain injuries? 
Go ahead. I would say the media, um, in the past, I would say brain injury survivors were often lumped together um, into like, you don't have a brain injury at all or you have a severe TBI where you are extremely debil debilitated and you have all of these um, things you struggle with. I think now we are seeing in TV shows, movies, in- um, It's gotten better, but it It's needs, gotten better, yeah. It, it still has, needs to. It's, yeah, it has, it's gotten better because I think now we're looking at, okay, something like a mild concussion, which someone might you know, downplay and they may say, oh, I just have a concussion. That is now looked at as, no, you had a brain injury and something serious happened to your brain. Mm -hmm. um, I think what we can do better in the future is, um, possibly displaying more of a range of symptoms. I think in the media it's often focused on anger because that's just, you know, the media loves drama, so they want to focus on an anger problem. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think in the future we can look at, okay, let's actually look at how someone struggles in their day-to-day -day with organization and functional skills. Okay. Um, it, now, words such as feeble, Mm -hmm. feeble-minded, chronically ill, mm -hmm. different things like that. Were there any specific words describing people with brain injury going way back? And how has stigma changed? Because certain words were not even, we're not even, and I'm gonna say it on this, we're not even supposed to use the R word. Yep. You know, uh, we're not supposed to use the word re retarded. Because when, um, when President Obama and a family, uh, somebody by the name of Rosa, ba back in his administration, Rosa's law specifically um, stopped the word retarded, mm -hmm. the R word. Um, how, has, how has stigma changed, uh, you know, from institutionalizing on down? Yeah, so I would say, um we talked about this before too, that it's institutionalizing. I think that that is probably the biggest change, I think. Um, we have, you know, years ago, people with severe brain injuries were likely put into an institution um, and likely deemed unsafe to be out in the community. Now, with all these waiver programs- Because oh, they're afraid people would my phone? Um, yeah, or, or maybe they had, um, again, difficult behaviors that other people didn't want to deal with. Um, or safety reasons too, they maybe were afraid that that, um, they just couldn't function in the community. So now, I think the, the biggest change now in 2024 is um, these these waiver programs really allow. I mean, we have the disabilities services program too. They really allow people with brain injuries and other disabilities to be in the community, have jobs. I mean, we hireability is a huge program. I'm sure you've heard of, and they're awesome. Um, you know, have jobs, vocational rehab, community college. Um, um, and so four year colleges, four year colleges. Go. Yeah. Yeah. So so in every step of the way, in every system, I think we're seeing more people with neurodevelopmental um, neurodevelopmental d disorders and uh, diagnoses and brain injuries and, you know, all across the spectrum, because we know it is a spectrum of, of neurodevelopmental and um, neurology. And um, we see people really doing well and exceeding expectations that their doctors may have told them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Since you said that, um, Americans with Disabilities Act mm -hmm. specifically states, I know I'm kind of jumping here, but it's, it's important. Mm -hmm. um, education. If someone wants to go to college, they get help through their disability services office. Any specific services that colleges or schools offer students with um, brain injuries that people might not know about? Yeah, I'm not sure actually. Um, I'm not positive. I do, I do think that higher education is trying to be better with that um, because I, I feel like in the past, higher education has kind of um, not been very accommodating to people with different brains, really. And I think Explain. just, um, you know, they, because of brain injury, oftentimes is not physical. So if someone has a brain injury. Silent. Yes, they, they, some, one client once told me, and this stuck with, this has stuck with me for, for, a, for a while, um, that they felt like they had an invisible wheelchair. So their brain injury, you know, someone on the street walking by them may not see that they had a brain injury. So in, in our, in our systems and for higher education being one of them, oftentimes 
people have been told, you know, I, I think you're lying. Do you actually have a brain injury? I've heard that before. It's a client tell me, you know, I've been asked, do you actually have a brain injury? Um, and so I assume that's happening in all levels, in even college, um, higher education. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what is the life expectancy mm. of, um, is there any specific life, to, uh, you know, I mean, people live, mm -hmm. 100, 106. What is the life expect, um, expectancy of someone with a brain injury? I'm not sure, honestly, and I actually don't even know. I'm sure da data exists out there in the world, um, but I assume that it's hard to pinpoint that data, or it's hard to measure that because every single brain injury is so different. Mm -hmm. um, whereas I feel, yeah, so the answer, my answer is I'm not sure, but I, I, I'm I, sure there have been studies out there. Um, I, I just don't, I don't, yeah, I don't know. Okay, let's talk about, sorry. I, so, no, it's okay. Um, what, what are some of the things that you guys do with the brain, uh, with your brain, with the Brain Injury Alliance? Um, um, in terms of your webinars, mm -hmm. your education, go ahead. Yeah, so we do Wednesday webinars. So every other Wednesday, um, we do free webinars that anyone can go on our website and sign up for. We recently had one on how to survive the holidays with a brain injury, and that was awesome. Ooh, that, yeah. Yeah, because... What we, was that about? Yeah, so that was mostly about how can we set boundaries as a survivor um, or as a family member of a survivor because holidays often you have, you're interacting with people you haven't seen in a while and if you have a brain injury or any you know other condition, um, I feel as often, oftentimes people... Um, put you in a box and, and even relatives can say to you, you know, oh, are, how, are you doing better? Are you doing worse? They can ask these like probing questions. And so that, that talk was really on how can we set boundaries for ourselves so that we won't feel crappy at the end of the holidays. What do you mean by being put in a box? So um, often survivors are, like I said earlier, put into that box of, um, oh, they're a brain injury survivor. They, they must they must struggle. They must struggle with things. And um, we at the Brain Injury Alliance really don't see it that way. We, we, similar to your philosophy of seeing, you know, how is somebody able to do something, not how is someone disabled? Um, so that's kind of like when I think of being put in a box, that's what I see for our survivors often. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what are some tips that you can, uh, okay, so now let's get back to neuroscience. Mm -hmm. Um, explain more about neuroscience and mm -hmm. how your agency helps with that. Yeah, so um, I'm not a medical professional, so I won't pretend that I know a ton. I do have a biology degree, so I know a little bit, but not... Um, but the field of neuroscience is really the study of the brain and neurotransmitters and electrical impulses and how does our brain work, really. And um, how does it work and how it does it... It works differently for a lot yes, of people. Yes, exactly. So now with this rise of, um, you know, neurodiversity, I think that's a huge emerging field of neurodiversity. And with that, and then just new ways of looking at the brain, looking at brain function, how brain function impacts physical functioning, um, brain body connection. So those are some, some emerging fields and I think that are becoming more popular in the media, the brain body connection specifically and neurodiversity. Mm -hmm. And um, our organization, uh, really works with clients with any type of brain. We people come to us and they they'll say, "Oh, I have um, I have MS, but I won't qualify for this service, or I make too too much money to qualify for this service." We will take them on our services because they have nowhere else to go. And um, what that means often is, you know, advocating advocating for them um, if they have a pro Can problem. Can you teach somebody how to advocate for themselves? Um, typically, no. We typically will refer people to um, the Vermont Center for Independent Living. They have a peer advocacy program maybe you've heard about. Um, and those are specifically people who work one-on-one -on -one with somebody with um, a brain injury or any type of um, anything going on and work with them to figure out how to advocate for yourself. So we can we refer people to that program very often. Mm -hmm. um, what... 
makes people scared mm. of things, right? Mm. You have a brain, if a person has a brain injury, they're afraid to go out and do stuff. Sometimes they're sheltered. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes, oftentimes, they might have PTSD or something else stopping them from doing something. Mm -hmm. What makes people so scared of, of their brain injury? Is it because they don't know enough about it, mm -hmm. about themselves? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I often, so I, myself and my coworker Beth, um, we run a support group for brain injury survivors. And I have learned the most about brain injuries in that group because, um, you know, when someone says, how do you learn about brain injuries? I'm a firm believer you learn from the people who are experiencing it. And so from that group, I've learned that one of the biggest struggles is seeing themselves after their injury realizing who they are now. What are my struggles? What do I want to do in life? What is my purpose? A lot of people lose their purpose after an injury because in America, we tie purpose to jobs often. So, um, you know, someone was a, um, a firefighter and then they got a brain injury and they no longer can do that. They may become very depressed because they lost their purpose. And so we see that very often with survivors. You say losing purpose. Mm -hmm. Is there a lot of depression with people who have doubt a brain injury? Yes, so, that, so a brain injury, and there, there is a lot of research on this, um, Often, brain injury survivors experience increase of symptoms of anxiety, depression, substance use. Um, those are the three big ones, and I'm sure there are others. But um, So oftentimes, people who have had a brain injury will go on to receive mental health treatment um, at some point in their lives. Yes, here it says right here. Mm -hmm. um, depression and, and traumatic brain injury. Um, this comes from, there's a website, for those that want to find out more about it, it's, there's another website here, uh, www.msktc.org uh, forward slash TBI. Um, it's about science and brain injury. Mm -hmm. um, so um, here it says, depression is a feeling of sadness. I'm just giving information. Yeah. Uh, sadness and despair of hopelessness and does not get better over time. It, uh, it's sometimes it can be overwhelming enough to interfere mm -hmm. with daily life, and it can cause a concern when feeling depressed and losing interest. Uh, usually, activities such as feeling down, uh, such as things like feeling down, blue, sad, and hopeless, uh, loss of interest pleasure, usual activities, changes in sleep, appetite, um, withdrawing from others, difficulty con concentrating, tiredness or lack of energy, moving and speaking slowly and fidgety, mm -hmm. uh, uh, thoughts of death or suicide. Yeah. How, and it says here, how common is depression and um, t and TBI. Depression is a common problem with TBI. Almost half of people with TBI are affected by depression within the first year after injury. Mm -hmm. Even more, nearly two thirds of people affected within seven years after the injury in the general population. Uh, the rate of depression is much lower, affecting fewer than one person in ten, fewer than one in ten, and one uh, over one year a one year period, more than half of people with TBI who are depressed <clears throat> also have significant anxiety. Mm -hmm. Yep. So um, I'm just bringing that. Uh, there's a whole website. Yeah. Um, that there's lots of information yes, out yes, there. Yes. Yes. Totally. Yeah. Um, that's something I but see. But being with your in your agency, mm -hmm. um, how big is the, is the counseling that you provide? Is it in person? Is it uh, telehealth? Because I remember during the pandemic, um, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so, so we, our options, or it's our neuro resource facilitation program is kind of a mouthful. We call it our NERF program. NERF. <laughs> NERF, yeah. Um, we, we often call it that. That um, is typically, it can be either. We really, something that we try really hard as an agency to do is to ask people, what is your preference? Do you, um, are you good with technology? Are you not that great with technology? Are you, do you like phone calls? Do you like email? Um, because we're trying to be as accommodating as possible because we know from listening to these people's stories that a lot of agencies are not accommodating. Mm -hmm. um, so oftentimes, Say that again. a lot of agencies are not accommodating um, to, to, to people that have different needs. Um, and especially now in a time of a huge technology re revolution and you know really um, high tech things, people are falling behind because they feel like I can't learn technology. And that's all someone will offer. That's all this, this provide, provider will offer me is, is a virtual appointment. So we ask all these questions. Um, what do you prefer? What do you, um, what works for you? What doesn't work for you? And we kind of go from there and see what each individual person likes. Um, not all counseling uh, not all counseling is the same, right? Yes, yeah, exactly. Not not every every single person we work with um, may be um, the frequency of check-in calls may be different. The frequency of emails may be different, really based on that person's needs and, and wants and what they do best with. Is there a lot of mental health issues? Yes. With People with brain injury, why or why not? Yes. Um, or, as I say, um, I don't mean to put this out there. Please forgive me if I said it. Mm -hmm. If I said it wrong, please correct me. Oh no. You Episodes. Yeah. So I would say, like, we, we don't want to get in trouble here and be yeah, that's politically okay. yeah. incorrect. Yeah, 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 totally. Um, I would say mental health struggles are very common with brain injury survivors. Um, closely, closely tied with the feeling of loss of purpose and hopelessness. Um, I mean, those are the things I hear over and over again in support groups. Um, oftentimes, feeling like no one else understands them. Their family members, their family members don't understand them anymore. Um, they don't, sometimes when someone has a brain injury, they have personality changes because one of the frontal lobe was affected. Um, so their personality may be slightly or- I mean, Do they yell? Do they scream? What, what, yeah, what are some of the episodes that people might go- through? Yeah, um, often, I mean, anger is a common one, um, but that's also, I personally think that um, that is a little bit of a stereotype that brain injury survivors have all have anger problems. Um, the people, the people that I work with, the clients I work with, I would say I don't see that trend. Um, but often in the, in the media, in um, social media, we see that stereotype exist. So. Um, yeah, I, I would say often it's really periods of hopelessness. Can you describe, in this case, mm -hmm. a more stereotype? What, mm -hmm. what would that be in, in terms of like, because we want to break the mold. Yeah. Go yeah. Ahead. So, so um, a stereotype that I, I see often is that someone with a brain injury has anger issues or anger out, outbursts um, mm -hmm. or they raise their voice often. Um, and when I talk to the individuals that are accused of this, I don't see it that way. My coworkers do not see it that way. We see it as they are being forced to interact with the system that is not accommodating them. So of course they're going to raise their voice. Of course they're going to advocate for themselves, which may look like getting angry, but Scream, really they're yell. frustrated. They're super frustrated with the system. They're frustrated with how they've been dealt with. They're frustrated with how they haven't been listened to. Um, so we, we rarely encounter people having outbursts over the phone with us because we're listening and we're telling them that we care and that we're showing them that we care. Um, a lot of agencies, can't do that with the, you know the volume of people that are calling them or um, staffing issues or just structural issues. Um, they can't do that. Well, uh, last question because um, I want to do kind of a commentary here because yeah. I, I am a brain injury survivor. But um, what um, what are the future goals of uh, Brain Injury Alliance? Yeah, so we have a lot of future goals. So we are really 
hoping to become a case management agency. So we're really hoping to um, case manage people with brain injuries so that they can um, really have knowledgeable case managers. Um, often in the field, we're seeing people who don't have much experience with survivors, they don't have much education about um, what a brain injury survivor goes through and what changes they have maybe had ha have had. So we're hoping to become a targeted case management agency, also still offer the things we offer now, but mm -hmm. add case management so that we can really um, help people in the way that we, they need. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'd like to thank you for joining you. Uh, joining me on um, Ableton on Air. For more information on um, the uh, Brain Injury Alliance of Vermont, you can go to www.biavt.org. Uh, that is www.biavt.org, the Brain Injury Alliance of Vermont. Um, I'm a brain injury survivor myself. Um, I've dealt with cerebral palsy and um, epilepsy. Uh, it's not easy having a brain injury, but let me tell you, we should not be prideful when asking for help. We should ask for help uh, when people want to come to us to give help. Um, what I mean by prideful, Many oftentimes, you know, um, people say they can't do it um, because they're disabled. They don't, um, but there, there are people that uh, we all need to attempt to survive here. People uh, like us, um, we are married, we have apartments, we have a life, we just need to have more groups such as the Brain Injury Alliance of Vermont to give us that assistance. I'm Lauren Seiler. See you next time on the next edition of Able Den On Air. Major sponsors for Ableton On Air include Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps, Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yihad of New York and New England, where everyone belongs, the Orthodox Union, the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, Montefiore Medical Center of the Bronx, Rose F. Kennedy Center of Bronx, New York, Albert Einstein College of Medicine of the Bronx. Able Den On Air has been seen in the following publications. Parchester Times, www.thisisthebronx.com, New York Pirate Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.h.com, and the Montpelier Bridge. Ableton On Air is part of the following organizations. The National Academy of Television, Arts, and Sciences, Boston, New England chapter, and the Society of Professional Journalists.